Thanks for joining us for Windbreaks 101. I'm Jeff Jensen, Field Coordinator with Trees Forever, and we have a great lineup of individuals to talk about windbreaks and species and wildlife benefits. Uh, so I'd like to introduce uh, Lindsay Barney. Uh, she's a district forester, and I'll let her tell you exactly her territory as things have changed over the years. <laughs> but basically, if you're in Western Iowa, you're probably going to be talking to Lindsay. Uh, we also have Brad Riphagen, uh, our very own Brad Riphagen from Trees Forever. And then Laura Canning from Cass. Oh, yes. Cass County <laughs> Conservation Board. Uh, with that, Brad, do you want to take it away? Yeah, certainly. Thank you. And um, what we're going to do is, um, when I'm talking here, I guess I'll, I'll turn off my, my monitor here shortly. Um, but I'm going to lead off and I'm going to um, kind of do a generalization, just uh, get people into thinking about windbreaks and what you need to think about, some of the things you need to think about um, in terms of getting them going and um, what kind of things they do for us. So Windbreaks 101. And first off, uh, y'all, I think you all know it's uh, St. Patrick's Day. So happy St. Patrick's Day. And as Jeff just did, uh, your presenters are tonight are listed right there. Um, and we'll just um, jump right into it. So the first, first off, I just kind of want to cover what windbreaks are, um, talk about some of the benefits and types. And I know Laura's going to get into some of the really into deep in depth and some of the wildlife benefits as we get into it. And then uh, some of the basic design considerations, things we need to think about. Um, location-wise and um, uh, types of things you want to include um, when you're designing your windbreak. So first off, what's a windbreak? You know, there you go. Well, it's it's um, it's pretty familiar practice that really <laughs> took um, hold back in the 30s after the Dust Bowl um, because we saw the negative impacts of wind. And so what windbreaks do are basically um, are living barriers that reduce winds. and uh, they create a wind shadow and, and protect certain areas that we're trying to protect. And so uh, they are a very, uh, very good conservation practice. Even, you know, even in a small lot, uh, they are a very good conservation practice. And so they provide many, many benefits. And we'll get into some of those as we go in. So here are some of those benefits. Um, I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to get into depth with a lot of them, but you see that there are um, some very traditional things that you a lot of times think about um, as benefits from, from windbreaks. Um, if you have them out in the field, you, they reduce soil erosion, they, they protect plants, they manage snow, uh, they reduce energy needs, a lot of those kind of things. They uh, enhance aesthetics, but there's some other things too that they do that are um, utilized when we, when we put together a windbreak and uh, things that we don't always necessarily think about. Um, they moderate noise, they screen views, you know, they uh, reduce uh, chemical drift, those types of things. Uh, carbon storage, definitely a, a something that we want to be more interested in. Mitigate odor, odors, and that's something we'll mention a little bit later too. Um, in Iowa, that's something that uh, is a benefit of windbreaks. So how does a windbreak work? Well, two ways basically. It modifies air, air currents, all right? So it changes how that air flows across the landscape. Um, it, it reduces sound waves, it, it alters them, it, it alters odor plumes, and it creates a microclimate. Um, it also does something other than directly with the wind, but it, it as a plant, um, most often here, it, it traps sediment, it traps, it causes snow to be deposited, it collects nutrients, many things like that. It, um, it traps some volatile organic compounds too. So there are a lot of things that windbreaks do for us that are valuable and, and um, just another reason to be planting those types of things. So, so what are the effects? Well, kind of talked about them already, but um, this is a little more detail, I guess, in terms of uh, it lowers that wind, wind speed, you know, reducing the, the velocity, um, causes stuff to drop out. So for instance, the thing we think about, you know, just coming off of, of winter here, uh, windbreaks are very important out in the country in terms of uh, determining where snow gets deposited in and around farmsteads and even along roadways a lot of times if they are properly uh, designed and placed. Uh, they also, like we talked about earlier, interestingly, they absorb chemicals from the air. I mean, the plants do a lot of, lot of work here and, and also alter that, um, that climate downwind of where the windbreak is so that 
we can plant certain things that um, may do better with a little more protection. So how can airflow patterns be modified? Well, so what we're looking at here is um, what does what does a windbreak do? What are the components of a windbreak that uh, cause us to be able to modify modify that wind wind flow that that airflow going across the landscape? And so what we have is a uh, eight or six different things here. So height, density, orientation, length, width, and continuity. So I'm going to kind of touch on all of those. Um, not heavily technical, but it's these are just things to think about as you are choosing species, which Lindsay will get into later, and um, and determining where and how to place a windbreak on your on your property. So height, height is is probably the mo is the most important factor that determines the down downwind area that's protected. So the way we look at this is is we measure the height, and usually when we design a windbreak, we're looking at um, a close to mature height. And that area is called H, just generally. It could be a number like 20, 40, 50, depending on what species you're looking at. But that height is uh, what uh, what is the tallest row of, of species in that windbreak. So um, a windbreak with um, a conifer like Norway spruce in it uh, could be designed probably for a 50-foot height at maturity, maybe taller, depending on how, how well it's doing. And so what you what you use that for is determine the area that's going to be impacted or, or favorably impacted by that that height and so the generalizations that they look at in terms of wind reduction in terms of speed is that even in front of the windbreak or, or on the windward side the wind is speed is decreased and so it is decreased in an area two to five times that height of the windbreak and downwind that wind speed can be affected um, up to 30 times the height of that of that wind windbreak. So, just as an example, um, a 20 foot windbreak um, will have a 40 percent reduction at four times the height, or 80 feet down down downwind. So, pretty easy figuring, but it just gives you an illustration of the impact of what height has on um, the wind uh, reduction as you move down landscape. So and that area, that zone of protection that's developed. So density, density is the amount, or basically, you guys can probably think about what that, it means is by how many plants really are out there causing that barrier between the wind and the area that you're protecting. So um, a really dense windbreak will have very few openings that the, the wind can move through. So, um, we're going to talk probably more so about some um, natives and so forth, but when you when you're looking at designing a windbreak that includes conifers, um, you can get density more quickly, and if you alter rows, you can fill that space in. And so a more dense windbreak is going to uh, drop those speeds more quickly and um, more greatly be right behind it. And so that's what you see in the graph to the right. Um, you know, a wind speed um, going through a, a more open open windbreak five times the height so say it was a 20 foot windbreak five times that is 100 feet downwind that wind speed is dropped by half um, in a more open windbreak and in one that's more dense um, it's dropped to less than or 30 percent of what that would be so uh, as you see on that graph six six miles per hour as opposed to 10 in a 20 mile an hour speed so again density has an impact on what that area behind or downwind or um, of that the windbreak is going to feel like and uh, and so that's another thing to be um, be considered as you're as you're developing a windbreak because sometimes if you have a very narrow space to work with your choices of species are going to be um, reduced if you really want to have maximum density so think about those things as you're thinking about designing your windbreak all right next is orientation okay so we all pretty much realize this right um in the winter here in iowa which way does our winds our winds typically come from well for the most part um out of the north and the west so 
well, you'll, you'll see that in many situations or as you move around the state that most of those windbreaks are oriented on the north and west sides of those properties, those farmsteads as you move around. But I know of places where they've planted windbreaks on the south. I mean, if you think about, um, if I think about the last snowstorm we had, it came out of the southeast. If you were planning for that, obviously you would you would want to be putting those, those uh, plantings on that area of your property to protect from that. And I know landowners who have specifically designed um, windbreaks for calving in the, in the spring, and it typically put them on the south side of their, of their calving areas because um, a lot of winds are coming in the early spring out of the south. And so um, that protection is needed for the, the animals at that time. So orientation is important. Um, and by knowing that, so the graph on the right, it's, it's a little bit, um, difficult to look at for me. I spent me spent a long time looking at it. But if you just had one line, say your wind was coming from the south, obviously that zone of influence or that area of protection is much larger if it's hitting perpendicular or at a right angle. I should say at a right angle to that windbreak, it's going to have a lot more effect. If it's coming from say a southwesterly angle, that area of protection is much less from that one leg. So it's just simply showing on a graph that. Um, it's important to, to orient these in terms of what your prevailing wind speeds are, or wind directions are, I should say. So another important consideration is length. And um, length is one of the, one of the big, a biggie ones again too, because although height determines the, the protection downwind, the length determines the amount of area uh, behind that windbreak that's gonna be protected. So obviously pretty obvious, but um, really really something that you want to think about because if you have the area to extend your windbreak beyond that particular say we lined up our windbreak just directly along the edge of that house to the left of that house any winds that came at an angle would not protect that house so extending it out um, helps that property a whole lot um, and will be much more beneficial in terms of what you're trying to do with your windbreak so length is very important Width, okay, width. So we talked about length and width. So width to me is like thickness. I think of thickness. So it's it's the distance from the outside edge to the inside edge of your of your windbreak. And the larger that number, the more benefits you can start um, working into your into your uh, windbreak. And so in this example here, you see a snow trap. Okay, so typically that happens a lot with uh, a row of of shrubs say outside of the maybe 30 40 feet outside of of the main windbreak itself and so that causes the snow to trip out deposit then you have your your main windbreak um, slows the wind down for the area that's being protected behind it and it also can can um, pr provide a lot of protection for wildlife and if you have many rows in your windbreak um, there are all kinds of, of wildlife services that can be produced um, Throughout that area, and and benefits for humans as well as uh, as well as wildlife. So, just if you have the space, I would encourage you to utilize as much of it as you can with your wind break, um, because the benefits just continue to increase. Continuity. This was one that's just you know something you may not think about a lot, but um, I found it rather interesting to think about because. I see it happening at my own place. I live on a small acreage and my windbreak is in process. Um, parts of it are good, parts of it aren't. But I have a driveway that shows up like you see here in this um, continuity gap. I have a nice row of shrubs on either, end, on either side of the driveway, but as you get to that point in the yard, if the wind's coming out of the north, northwest, you're, you are feeling that the exacerbated effects or the increased effects of that wind uh, speeding up around that corner. And so you can get additional wind speeds um, beyond what the speed is uh, out in the open through some of those gaps. And and as as is typical, I get a nice pile of snow there on a regular basis. It's just that's where the driveway is and that's where the shrubs are. So something you need to deal with on uh, as well. This uh, little graph on the right actually illustrates something nicely to me. The purple area is the 80 to 
the same wind speed. So say it's 20, so um, you know, 100% would be 20 miles an hour, 80 would be what, uh, 16 or something like that. But anyhow, the idea of the, the effect of the windbreak having um, an effect on the upwind side or the, um, the windward side uh, is shown in this graph by that green area lane right next to the, uh, the top of the, the windbreak is showing a 60 to 80%, the wind speed is 60 to 80% of what it is out in the open. So it's just kind of a nice way to see how that, that lays out um, and that there is an impact um, on the windward side. And you'll see that a lot of times from snow even, there's a pile of snow that develops in front of the windbreak as well as behind, a lot of times behind it as well. So uh, just something to also think about. So I, again, if you have gaps in your windbreak, if you can fill them in, if you can fix, you know, uh, plant in those areas, it's important to try to do that because continuity is going to um, help you with, with the uh, benefits you're looking for from your windbreak. All right, so there, that's kind of the, the structural points that you're looking for. The things that you want to develop for your, or think about while you're developing your windbreak. There are lots of different types of windbreaks, uh, different reasons for doing them. And so I'm just going to cover a little bit of that. But um, one of the things that, you know, is, is important to a lot of us um, is that by having a well-developed windbreak around your site, um, energy costs in the winter can be reduced greatly. And so some estimates go up to 40%, which is wonderful if you can get a well-established windbreak. The problem is none of them occur overnight. So uh, planting is, uh, is an important thing to be doing. So I'm gonna cover a couple different types. Um, the first one is basically farmsteads. And we, we many of us are familiar with this. Um, and you see some really, um, good windbreaks here, although Lindsay's going to talk a little later, I hope, about um, using more uh, uh, deciduous trees in the windbreaks as well, which is a wonderful, wonderful uh, way to go because in Iowa we have some struggles with raising uh, conifers. So, but um, you see very well protected areas uh, from these windbreaks and you see different different designs too. I mean, a U-shaped one around this, this particular homestead here and uh, so they're they're trying to block winds from three different directions, which is uh, interesting as well. And um, some days that I would like to do that as well myself because the wind really does come whipping from the south sometimes. There's other reasons, obviously, to plant windbreaks. And as I talked about earlier, livestock is an important one in Iowa uh, for many people. And so uh, what we find is that, as I mentioned earlier, um, I worked with a landowner who planted a windbreak for his calving pasture and uh, that's a great benefit. I know a number of um, even even around your your barn facilities or your your uh, outside uh, feedlots. I mean it's a it's a wonderful thing for the animals. They they show that they they do better in those situations uh, where they're not as stressed and so again another another benefit and another place to be using windbreaks. And then there's specialty windbreaks, and I kind of alluded to some of these earlier. Um, snow, snows, living snow fences. So it's wonderful if we could get some of these, more of these on the landscape. They they do a wonderful job of keeping snow off of problem areas on roadways um, around the, the state. And you see this um, once in a while, a county will uh, offer a landowner so much to uh, leave like eight or rows, eight to 10, uh, eight, 12 rows of their corn standing um, to help block that snow. But if we could do something permanent or with a, a perennial vegetation would be uh, show a lot more benefits beyond just the snow catch, uh, wildlife being one of those. So, I mean, it's, a, it's a, a great practice if we could get more of it in use. But as you can see, if you look going up that hill, down at the bottom of the hill, there's snow across the road. As you're going up the hill, there's no snow across the road. And, this, and obviously that, that living snow fence is doing its job. What we find around here a lot too, and Iowa raises a lot of animals, but around those, those animal buildings, um, dust and odor are an issue. And um, I find that these windbreaks, once they get some age to them, work quite well at, at reducing dust and odor. 
Um, I was just at a landowner's site a couple of years ago and he's had a windbreak in for 10 years. So it's getting mature, it's getting some good size. And standing next to the buildings, um, it didn't, it wasn't a wonderful smell and, and moving a couple rows into the windbreak, I couldn't even notice it anymore. So it was, it was an impressive actually lesson for um, the value of a windbreak. Also, we found that these landowners um, don't want those dust fans to be blocked up. And so if they can catch that snow before they hit them, because a lot of them, when you get a lot of snow, will will pile snow up against those buildings. And so they'll need to dig those fans out. And so uh, windbreaks serve that purpose as well. So multi-purpose windbreaks. Well, so we talked about a lot of reasons to plant windbreaks. So this one shows deciduous trees and conifers and a whole variety of things. And that is a wonderful thing. Um, there are things that you can do in windbreaks um, if you're going to be utilizing it um, for one function, say protecting protecting your house or whatever from winter winds, incorporate some some food producing shrubs, um, some berries or some nuts or something like that, and uh, incorporate uh, trees that provide great wildlife benefit, oaks and so forth. And um, some folks, you know, if you if you're using enough land area and you do uh, if you do say uh, use firewood or something you can use a short cycle um, wood and actually harvest some of that as you move along too i don't know if we're doing a whole lot of bioenergy from from wood right now but that's um another thing you could think about but that anyhow those are kinds of things that as you're developing your windbreak really think about the species um, and think about how much area you can utilize because the more you can utilize for this the more value you're going to get beyond simply um those those energy benefits or the the uh, nicer habitat behind behind the windbreak um, the aesthetics for your property is even just amazing so think, think about those things as you're developing your windbreak and that is pretty much what I got so it's a it's a great practice um, it is something that every uh, I believe every NRCS office in the state I don't know if they all fund them. I'm pretty sure there's some sort of funding source with many of the many counties out there. Um, there's usually design help in most of those places. And um, it's a place to start, I guess I should say, in terms of uh, figuring out what you'd like to do. Um, but again, multi-functions, uh, many benefits, and um, they can be designed to meet your needs and your objectives. So really really spend some time thinking about where you'd like to put one and and uh, how to get it done because I I can't stress the value of them. I mean, I I wish my windbreak was more ex expansive because uh, those winter winds that whip across our property are, are really cold. And so it'd be uh, nice to have a much better windbreak where we live as well. So with that, any questions? Well, thanks, Brad. Uh, we've got all sorts of questions in the questions box here. And while I make um, uh, Laura our next presenter, I'm going to ask them, what trees will deer not destroy? Ooh, what won't they destroy? Uh, something that's fenced. If you fence it, <laughs> fence out the deer, typically they won't destroy it. Um, I... Yeah, uh, I, I guess I haven't seen him destroy a red cedar. Not that I'm recommending well, necessarily, but I don't think I've seen him destroy that. So funny you should bring that up because one of the next questions is: Is there a place for red cedar in windbreaks? This this is going to be controversial because red cedar is one of those love them or hate them trees, and so I'm going to let Laura and actually Lindsay both give their take on it here when they get their chance. Um, it's it's hard to control because birds spread it so badly i see so many ditches taken over by this thing and it's like a weed but it is it is the toughest um evergreen or i should say it's not a conifer but the toughest evergreen that we have that's native to the state and will grow anywhere um hence it's probably kind of a weed too so i'm, I'm gonna it will do i don't know if i'm directly answering the question but uh, it is I'm not going to plant it, but I'm not going to stop people from necessarily planting. I guess either. So, how's that? <laughs> I'm not very good. 
I know. And, and, and we, we got some crowdsourcing here. And so Maggie said that deer won't destroy honey locusts. Oh, so, there you go. Uh, that might be a good species option right there. So there Doug wants go. to know, when you say a small lot, you know, how small are you really referring to? Are we talking, you know, lots well, of town here? Or are we talking? Yeah, I'm going to say you have a lot in town and you have space. Um, to the north and west of your um, front door, if, if you have winds that catch your front door and you wanna plant two or three trees that are shrubs that might slow that wind down, I think that is, you know, that is an acceptable and, and good idea. Um, now, again, depending on the orientation of your lot, make sure you have that, that particular plant spaced far enough from your driveway or whatever you don't want the snow to be deposited on and that's another point i didn't make is that we typically do not um or we make sure that there's a hundred feet between the last row or the inside row of our windbreak and the the particular thing we want to have protected so you want to have that space just in case you have a lot of snow deposition but in a town situation you have a lot of other trees and so forth happening and so i think if you're trying to direct some wind, I don't see any reason not to incorporate a, a tree or two or a, sh a couple shrubs to alter that that speed as it gets to um, whatever you're looking at protecting. So your garden or whatever. Great, great. But there's two questions about species, so we're going to hold off on those because uh, we'll have a, a specific presentation on that. But a question: How can I incorporate food producing trees or shrubs into a windbreak? Oh, Jeff. I, the reason I say that is because Jeff is is my hazelnut guru, and so I would say many times when when tr windbreaks are designed and developed, they're looking at a couple rows. Typically, you know, the standard is a, a row or two of evergreens and then a row or two of shrubs. So if we just go with that standard, and I'm I'm wanting to think about beyond that a little bit tonight, but if we just go with that standard, there's a couple rows rows of shrubs there that could bring a lot of diversity. To your planting and could be included as food. Um, so hazelnuts could go in that area. Um, aronia berries, although I don't know, um, it could be for your own personal use. Um, what other things? What other shrubs could we? Elderberries are some things that produce food. There's there's a number of different shrubs that you could think about that you could alter, weave in and out, um, but would um, would work well uh, in a windbreak situation and provide you some of those things. So that's where I would go. Excellent. Well, thanks, Brad. Uh, I think that's good for the questions for now. Brad, take the show. All right. Well, I am Laura Canning. Um, I am located down here in Southwest Iowa. I work for Cass County Conservation Board. Uh, my degree is in environmental education and interpretation. Uh, so even though we're going to be talking about wildlife today, I uh, have some wildlife background, but I do not have a bachelor's degree in wildlife, so I wanted to put that out there. <laughs> but um, uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the benefits to windbreaks for the wildlife, but also uh, for you as well, and uh, be thinking about your whole yard and uh, land at, as a whole as well. Um, so. Um, let's see if I can get this to go here. All right. So, um, inventorying what do you have? What is an existing in your habitat? Um, you know, what is adjacent as well? So, um, what's existing in structures? But maybe think on that larger picture uh, as well in your in your section in your neighborhood. Uh, where where you're at, um, things like that. So having that kind of inventory and a little bit of that mixed habitat written down um, is going to help because I also, you know, have people think a little bit more on larger scale that plan, okay, then what does my look, yard look like? So thinking about what structures are there, where's your house, you know, of course, where other structures might be, you know, your garden or your backyard. You know, I'm a very visual person, so I like to uh, 
you know, draw it all out and then kind of look to see also, you know, where are you seeing your wildlife in your yard? Um, and does that change it with the seasons as well? Um, does your, one of the things on, on my slide here, you know, thinking about does, does your soil in your backyard change? You know, if you um, are not, uh, if you don't have, um, might not know, you know, what soil you do, you know, soil type you do have in your backyard, you know, um, soil tests can be done here, at least if you're in Iowa. Um, our Iowa, Iowa State Extension Office does a great job of some soil testing, things like that. So, um, you know, kind of design where are some things in your in your backyard um, and think about that larger picture too um, in the neighborhood uh, as well. The, as we go through here talking about our uh, talking about our wildlife plans and our plan here. So I like to tell people, no, there's not a magic formula. So if you thought that was gonna happen today, <laughs> But um, we're going to talk about then, of course, you know, since we're talking about animals and wildlife out there, you know, they're going to need in your space that food, shelter, and water, of course. Um, maybe there are some things already provided in your yard. Um, and then, you know, uh, what desires do you have of either, and that could be of wildlife, that could be of species. Uh, you know, actually picking your species for your windbreak, things like that. Um, and, you know, I, Brad uh, hinted to it as well. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, I've, I, I know with my, uh, uh, my yard, my windbreak, we're still working on it seven years later. So, um, so you, you've got a little bit of that happening as well. It is, uh, it can be multi-purpose as well not just uh, just don't think of wildlife um, itself as well you know you're in there you know you might have an animal operation um, you know next door things like that this one's a little bit more bird this slide's a little bit more bird focused uh, or the, some of the things listed are more bird focused you know to create more healthy yard that healthy uh, windbreak, you're going to want native plants. You might, you know, are there existing water features nearby? Uh, are you trying to attract anything uh, nesting and things like during their nesting season? Uh, and of course, you know, a lot of these things that we're going to touch on today is their food or their feeding as well. You know, um, maybe you inherited, you know, a property that has invasive plants. You know, uh, talking about working on that um, as well, you know, maybe let right alongside of planting your windbreak. The, um, we talk about, you know, you're going to, you might find that, you know, building and planting a windbreak, of course, you're going to have less lawn to mow. <laughs> um, I know that's definitely, um, I have a large, large uh, acres and I, I'm all for that. <laughs> Mowing takes up too much of my time sometimes. Um, so let's think about wildlife for a minute. You know, not only just, you know, desired species, um, but again, back to this inventory, what's existing? What do you see in your yard in the winter and the spring? Where are they coming from too? Back to maybe you do, you know, you want to put it on a map and draw your yard, um, things like that. Um, again, you know, you might have those water structures um, nearby, or that's maybe that where they're going. So uh, look at what you have too, but then what do you want next? Or what do you want out of it? You know, again, uh, looking at maybe your whole section as a, 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 in that larger picture that I have crop ground next door, uh, but I know north of me, there's some CRP, things like that. Um, are you connecting what you're going to make? Is it connecting as a wildlife corridor? Um, and this can be multiple multi-purpose. Some uh, some of our questions that have already popped up about um, edible for you, also edible for the wildlife as well. Um, 
that uh, that's one of the things that attracted to some of my uh, picks of species in my shrub row was what am I going to do with it? And then what also is going to be attracted by um, what I'm putting there? <clears throat> so again, we're starting to talk a little bit about tailoring your plan. Um, you know, um, maybe have that list of species, a uh, list of things you might be doing. You're working on some invasive species removal of some uh, plants. Um, but then we're going to, and we talked to, uh, Brad talked a little bit about these things already. You know, how much space do you have, number of rows and diversity that you're going to put in there and things like that. So some of these things Brad touched on as well. <clears throat> Before we get too far, <laughs> I wanted to throw this in and point out a little bit more windbreaks and shelter belts. And because of what wildlife you might be focusing or wildlife species you're going for, shelter belts might be more what you are looking for. Um, so shelter belts are more rows, and uh, whereas windbreaks are usually less than five. Um, and so once you're getting up over that five mark um, in general, then you're, you're, you're edging into that shelter belt um, territory. And maybe that's what you end up um, figuring out that your site needs as well. It, and a little bit of that, you know, uh, we're talking about chemical drift and things like that. Uh, they, they can provide a little bit more protection as well. Um, wanted to put this slide in here. Uh, it, it's a good side visual of some of the things I'm gonna go into um, when we get into really talking about our wildlife and uh, some of the species in, inside the rows. You look at that top row it's the we've got the crops and you've kind of got that uh fence row filter you know it might be grass that filter strip of grass and then you get into that windbreak and then you get into that um and then maybe there's is a green space um that is you know butting up to your house things like that and i want to point out me that third row down um is again the crops and then that grass a little bit more of that grass filter into your windbreak. But this one points out vine crops and having raspberries and things like that. You know, it is put on in here as a linear, um, like a row. Um, just, just know that you don't have to uh, visualize also in rows. You could, you know, your vine crop, you know, your vines, uh, your blackberries, raspberries might be in a corner, especially if your windbreak is L-shaped, things like that. Um, so wanted to kind of uh, point this out because uh, I'm a very visual person and I like to see um, when we get into here what row some of these things might uh, work best in. All right, so examples of some wildlife that might have been already on your radar that you want to you wanna see more of in your yard, things like that. Um, you know, as we go into this, of course, we're going to, I want you to kind of keep in the back, back of your mind, I'm going to, we're going to make some suggestions here. Um, the, this is based in Iowa a little bit more, so our, our suggestions are a little bit more Iowa native based. Please cross-reference uh, some of these species with whether or not it's going to grow in your zone that you live in. What is it going to grow in the soil that you have in your yard? Uh, things like that. So I just wanted to put that caveat in here as we go into some examples. <clears throat> so song, we think of songbirds and birds, but then the, the last two on my list here are a little bit more or a little bit less thought of when it comes to windbreaks. You know, we got small game and large game. Um, you know, things that are going to help everyone, of course, is planting natives. And, you know, you don't have to worry about with natives that there's not good nutritional value there to the wildlife. Um, we're talking about windbreaks today, of course. So we all want your windbreak to be successful. And so you're gonna get that better success if you're planting natives, not some funky cultivar <laughs> that you might've picked up somewhere. So um, the, 
we're going to go into each one of these on on the left um, individually here with some uh, some some recommendations. Of course, birds is one of the first things we think of. I think with when we talk about windbreaks, uh, one study listed 108 species of birds using windbreak. They're actually also the most studied um, with when when you look at windbreak studies, they look at birds a lot. Um, it's actually harder to find some of the other studies out there um, that are not birds. Uh, 29, they list 29 um, in the Midwest, 29 species that benefit substantially and 37 that benefit moderately from windbreaks. So some good options here for these birds. We've got uh, elderberry and aronia berry. Uh, Besides, we've got the service berry on here, red osier, your dogwood, your sumacs. Um, those are all going to be uh, in your shrub rolls. Um, when you get into uh, service berry, um, that's a little bit taller. Sumacs can be a little bit taller. Uh, and then you get into um, the rows that are uh, the tallest. And you've got you know, a hardwood suggestion like black cherry. Uh, you know, also, again, since we're talking a little bit about rows, be wary of what is catching that outer row. Um, is it in the outer row? And then, of course, is it edible at the time your neighbors, if, especially if you've got crop, crop ground next door, you know, that, that may be spraying? You know, it, with some of our species, that's not an issue at all uh, that the uh, berries are not on at all uh, when in, in that type of season as well. Uh, think about um, some more hardwoods, of course, too, you know, uh, woodpeckers and nut hatches are going to like those chestnuts and hickories and oaks. Um, you know, if you're looking at traditional conifers, you've got those conifers also then attracting grosbeaks beaks and woodpeckers, um, juncos in the winter, things like that. Um, we talked a little bit, uh, some of these that are listed are more fruit bearing, uh, you know, th then that's going to attract your wax wings and your robins, uh, things like that. <clears throat> I'm a visual person. I threw some slides in here of some uh, pictures. Um, so, uh, you know, what, you know, does that dogwood look like? The red osier dogwood um, is listed in the, I listed that one in the bird category. A lot of the dogwoods are still great overall for um, more than just birds. Same way with service berries, a little bit of a taller native, um, turns that pretty color, I believe, in the fall. And here's our choke cherry, our, a, a native shrub that uh, that is out there that has uh, the white blooms pretty close to the, and then you've got that black cherry is a deciduous option um, for birds. All right, a little bit about uh, small, what I'm going to consider small game. Um, we talk about uh, quail, pheasants. Um, there, are, uh, the scientific studies out there about uh, small game, at least, you've got 28 species considered in that, cons sometimes considered into that small game, um, and then uh, using the windbreaks, and then seven species uh, they have found in their research are are, are highly dependent on those. Uh, wind breaks as well. Um, I'm gonna you know, we talk a little bit about, you know, these are, some, you know, the small game, the birds, the pheasants, and things like that. Um, you also have to understand a little bit about that predator-prey relationship, of course, that knowing that there might be prey purchase, perches made, um, and how you can combat that if you're, when you're looking at your windbreak design. Um, is there sufficient escape cover um, for that if this is, you know, one of these is your target species? If you're catching, if you do a snow catching shrub row, you can, you know, plant that blue stem Indian grass that's listed um, next, next door to it, but just also know it's not as sturdy of winter cover um, it, it, if you are really looking to add winter cover for these guys, um, then Switch grass can be an option in some situations, um, but think about uh, these little guys, these quail, 
they really need smaller paths um, and more open of an understory to escape instead of that grass. Um, so we talk about it was something that works a little bit for both is those raspberries and blackberries, you know, and this doesn't have to be a row. Um, this could be a corner if it's L-shaped, things like that. Um, and those, so sometimes you can um, incorporate a little bit more of those grass filters either um, on either side of your shrub rows and things. Um, dogwoods are another great species for pheasants um, that, uh, that allow them to uh, escape besides, uh, and of course, hazelnuts and things that's in the shrub row. Um, somebody asked about deer resistant. I wanted to add to that. Uh, gray dogwood is very sturdy uh, as a sturdy shrub, um, and then and the deer. Besides, you know, Lindsay will probably get into this about protecting and uh, protecting your your shrubs with fencing and things like that. But uh, gray dogwood also can be pretty resistant um, to uh, getting rubbed on by deer and things like that. Don't forget, of course, you know, a little bit about squirrels and rabbits are going to be attracted. They're included in the small game category um, by your hazelnuts or if you are doing um, a more deciduous windbreak as well. <clears throat> I wanted to put some pictures up of what these hazelnuts and gray dogwood look like uh, as well. Um, I know I have both of these in my windbreak. All right, large game. Uh, I, we we got to talk about it a little bit, <laughs> at least, uh, because I at least in Iowa we do consider wild turkey um, not in small game category, actually in more into that into that large game category. But every state is a little bit different. Uh, they of course benefit from windbreaks. If you're going to build your windbreaks, going to be more of a have more hardwoods in it. You're going to see animals that arm those mast heavy species more in your windbreak. So again, those hazelnuts are a shrub, but then you you know, if you have those hardwoods added in, or even if those hardwoods are in your yard somewhere as well, you might be creating that corridor um, for them to be safely getting into your yard and then um, eating your mast and your, your acorns and things like that. Um, you know, uh, where I, I just want to put a little caveat here at the end uh, about uh, more edible uh, edible species. You know, we were talking about what. So then, you know, what what we listed of what we can eat. You know, you know, we got the wild plum and the elderberry. Um, I have those in mine as well. Um, you know, my husband love. You know, we love to make jelly. So, you know, we're, we're also using that windbreak um, as well um, as the wildlife as well. So, you know, some people, you know, want that in their um, windbreak just as that multi-use, you know, not only are the wildlife benefiting from it, but those, uh, those uh, you know, us too, you know, kind of thing as well. Um, so. <clears throat> Questions for me, I'm gonna, this is my contact Excellent. info if you are in my area. Um, every, where we're unique here in Iowa, we've got county conservation boards that help with things and um, we're available as well as uh, for some advice and things like that. So Laura, so, someone asked about using viburnum in food. Ever made jelly out of viburnum? Yeah, um, viburnum, um, some viburnums are native in Iowa, um, things like that. Uh, yep. Excellent. So going back to one of the questions about, we uh, missed one here for succession. So um, Mary Ellen wanted to know, can you talk about succession planting? And this is for everyone, not just for you, Laura. We're going to crowd this. Okay, good, because I was but thinking what, that was a Lindsay one. I did see that one earlier. <laughs> what fast growing trees can I plant and take out after the uh, longer growing trees mature? 
And I'll yeah. just jump in. And, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. I just going to say we're going to talk about that directly. Oh, then we'll skip it. Excellent. Then that's all I have. So why don't I um, let Lindsay get her presentation brought up here. Lindsay, you are now the presenter. And we'll get some of these species questions answered straight away. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Absolutely, thanks, Lindsay. Okay, perfect. So my name is Lindsay Barney, I'm district forester for southwest corner. Now I have covered a lot of western Iowa, so if you see some pictures in here that look like western Iowa, that's because that's where they came from. Um, We'll see if it'll let me advance here. Okay, so one of my plugs, um, having spent the last almost 11 years uh, doing sick tree diagnosis on windbreaks every May and June, is uh, seeing some of the difficulties people have with certain species and uh, some of the pros and cons with different things. And it's gonna kind of bounce around everything we've talked about already. And one of the things that I think might be a, an interesting twist and solve a lot of problems that, as, is if people would consider hardwood windbreaks. And that includes hardwood shrubs, hardwood trees. And when I say hardwood, it means anything that loses its leaves in the, basically in the winter time, that's a hardwood um, or deciduous, kind of the same thing. So here's some examples of what a hardwood windbreak would look like. Um, out on the landscape, you may have seen them and just didn't know, you might just have thought it was a grove of trees, but you know, 120 years ago, people planted hardwoods around their farmsteads. They used them as woodlots uh, for fuel wood and also for windbreaks, and they still exist today. So that's a testament to their um, durability. They do require more space, which is why I have a hard time convincing people to try them. Um, obviously, trees that lose their leaves in the wintertime are not going to have as much wind blocking power, so you need more rows of them. But uh, on certain sites, they're basically the only thing that will work. So it's, it's worth um, considering if you have one of those special sites. And like I was just saying, um, Certain sites like poorly drained soils would be an example or excessively drained sites in some situations or um, there's there's a whole bunch of Iowa that um, there's just there's certain windbreak conifers that just do poorly because of our, our fickle weather conditions and I'll get into that. Um, these hardwood windbreaks I think the minimum specs would be six to eight rows of hardwoods. And if you guys want to know specifics on spacing and all that, we can get into it later. Um, and like I said, they're exceptionally suited to poorly drained sites. Um, on my own trial windbreak at my place, I have used um, species suited to poorly drained sites on a well-drained site and have had exceptional um, success with that. And um, some of these trees, like I just mentioned, are extremely fast to establish, even as hardwoods, um, if you plant them correctly. So, you know, here's a picture of your normal evergreen windbreak. Some, I think, minimum specs, like Brad was saying, are two rows of conifers, one row of shrubs. That's the basic one, I think, that reap, um, that reap rules require. Most people want this type of windbreak because they can fit in a small space. Um, they make an excellent windbreaking barrier. They can be slow to establish because some of these species need uh, pretty wide spacing in order to keep them healthy. And the wider you space them, even if you stagger between rows, um, it, it can take 20 plus years to get a windbreak to develop. And like we've mentioned, there's only certain soil types that some of these evergreens are going to do well on. If there's any kind of substantial clay component, 
or poorly drained site, I just basically don't even consider um, evergreens suitable. So I'm gonna go over, this is what I've spent a lot of time in May and June um, on the phone with people about are these common issues with evergreens. And this would be my plug for maybe reasons why you might wanna consider using hardwoods if you have the option. So this is something we might see in the next month or so. Um, winter burn is something that happens when the ground is still frozen and we get a sudden warm up like we had, when was that, like a week or two ago when we get into the 60 degree temperature range and the, the trees want to start transpiring but their roots are and the soil's frozen so they get this flash burning effect like you see. And um, it kind of deforms them temporarily. They'll get new uh, needles, so it takes a little bit of time to, to get that, but it still is a stressor on the, on the tree. Um, there are certain species that are exceptionally prone to this, like you see in the picture, the, the white cedar, common to that, concolor fir, also common in spruces too. Um, there are certain things you can do to help prevent that by not planting those species or planting them on interior rows away from the sun and the wind. Uh, mulching does a lot for preventing this, and if you're willing to go to this uh, effect, anti-desiccants are an option, which is basically like a uh, waxy material you spray on the tree and it keeps the uh, moisture in the needles. A uh, common one that we've been seeing in the last several years is herbicide damage. Um, a lot of these windbreaks are up against an agricultural field or pasture, and if they're sprayed at certain times of the year, like when the candling happens, when they get new growth, then you start to see damage like you see in these photos. And there's certain um, chemicals that are used in both turf, pastures, and uh, crop fields that are really, really hard on trees um, that you might not know are, are being used in turf. So, if you see weird symptoms like this that aren't associated with frost or something else like that, you might want to look and see if, if something you've put in your turf has possibly caused this. Uh, this is a common disease uh, to spruces. It's called rhizosphere needle cast. And this one happens when the trees are planted too tightly and the moisture basically can't get out of the, the needles of the tree there's just a lack of airflow this fungus forms on the needles and the interior needles fall off and it makes the tree look pretty bad um you can spray for this before and after the new growth occurs in the year in the spring this is very expensive if you do it on every tree and uh it's preventable if you pick certain kinds of trees to use and um, have a wide spacing Cytospora canker is the most common cause of spruce related problems and death in blue spruce and black hill spruce uh, in western Iowa anyway. So if I get a phone call of someone talking about uh, like a whole limb dying or they see white candle wax flowing down their the trunks of their trees or on their branches, um, I start thinking about this and then I dive into looking for the symptoms you see in those pictures. This is number one killer, like I said, of Colorado blue spruce, which is why blue spruce is not on our recommended species list for windbreaks. A lot of people ask for exemptions for this, but this is why. About year 15 or 20 of a windbreak, um, that's when this canker develops, and that's right when you're starting to get a fully functional windbreak. So that, we don't want people to get in that scenario where they lose their windbreak right when it's becoming effective. Um, there are certain things in the environment that make this worse. So our, our crazy weather patterns, like when we're going from drought to excessively wet, cold, hot, um, Iowa's really hard on evergreens, I would just say in general. And then we have all these funguses floating around and uh, hail storms can be entry points for this fungus. And it, it's just, all around not great. And if you've got a clay soil, it just compounds all these problems. So just things to keep in mind. Um, if you've had an old 
Austrian pine or Scotch pine windbreak like a lot of people did in Northwest Iowa, and they've died just rapidly within a month. Um, that might be pine wilt nematode, depending on the circumstances. But if, if you see rapid, rapid wilting, rapid death in, in a Scotch or Austrian pine, that's likely what this is. And it's, it's not a disease, it's a microscopic worm that's transported into the tree by another insect. It basically plugs up the bloodstream, if you want to think about that, of the, of the tree and it causes that wilting. Our native pines are somewhat resistant to it, so white pine would be a good alternative or jack pine if, if you wanted to avoid that. But if you had a full-blown pine wilt problem on a site and wanted to plant pine again, I would probably discourage you from doing that. Uh, we practice sanitation cutting. So in this picture you see on the right, um, if one tree is sick, we try to get that out of there down to, down to ground level, chop that tree up and burn it just to get that um, contaminated, the wood contamination out of there. And these are common root rots that we see in windbreaks. Like I think that picture I took in Carroll County a long time ago where it was actually hurting red cedar. So armillaria root rot is, is a common hardwood issue. It causes yellowing of the needles. Um, if you were looking for it, you get right under the tree, look at the lower bark color and, and look for kind of a white creamy, kind of a, Kind of like white leathery fungal looking stuff right at the root flare. Similar to that, Phytophthora canker uh, and rots are wilt, they cause wilting and stunted foliage, chlorosis, which means yellowing, and eventual death. Um, these are really problematic because they stay in the soil. So if you have random tree death and you don't know why and it can't be contributed or attributed to anything that you're aware of, I'd be starting to look at a soil sample to see if those things are lingering in your site because you don't want to plant anything else in that site until you figure out what pathogen you're dealing with. And it seems like these are exacerbated again on clay sites. So spider mites are another issue I see. Um, right in the heat of summertime usually. Uh, they're very, very hard to see unless you have a sheet of white paper and you sh shake the needles out on it and get a <laughs> magnifying glass out and look for the little mites. Um, but generally it makes the foliage, as you can see on that top picture, kind of dingy gray. Um, can do a, a number on spruce trees if they're already struggling. You can see fine webbing between the needles, but there's other things that can do that too. And that's where the sheet of paper comes in to see if you can find the little mites. Um, if you think you have them, um, or if you don't know, you can have an arborist come check, but um, you can treat with the registered miticide in early June or July. Another way to deal with mites is dormant oil, which is applied uh, in the you know, dormant season or early spring. So here's some other things that can help you maintain the, your tree health, whether it's a windbreak or shrub planting or individual trees. I really like this graphic I found, uh, I think it's from the Southeast somewhere where it's talking about ways you can kill a tree. And I can vouch for this, that these are all extremely common ways that trees die that people don't know about. Um, here's my own list of reasons I see trees dying. <laughs> Improper planting, and one of those ways is that one of the defaults to plant a windbreak quickly is with augers, and if you're going into clay and you use an auger, um, sometimes you get your, your planting hole too deep, not wide enough, and then you're basically creating a clay, like a terracotta pot to put your tree back into, and the little fine roots can't get out of that pot, and so they just struggle and strangle themselves until they eventually die. So there's ways we can prevent that, uh, even if you've got a harsh site. Planting too deep is one of the common, most common ways that uh, containerized trees die in urban settings. And I would say that probably follows suit with uh, rural plantings too. Improper spacing is um, 
with spruce trees, like I said, if you plant them too tight, like the old specs used to say 15 to 20 feet apart, and they actually need 25 to 30 feet apart, that, that's where you get into fungal problems that can kill your trees. Um, disease from lack of diversity. So pine wilt and Phytospora canker are examples of diseases from lack of diversity. Uh, the, the spruce diseases are spread by rain splash, so they go tree to tree down your windbreak until the whole thing's dead. Same thing with pine wilt. Herbicide damage, so you want to think if your rows closest to an herbicide treated area are sensitive to those herbicides, you might want to contemplate a different kind of tree. Um, you can also overwater your trees and cause some of those root rots. Um, and super common is planting the wrong tree for the for the site and the soil conditions. And we're gonna, I'll, I'll tell you ways to figure that out. Another thing to consider is your nursery stock. So a lot of people I talk to are like, yeah, I got a good deal at the box store and I got the last trees on, you know, on the parking lot. Well, some of those trees have been sitting there baking in the sun for two months and there's a reason why they're on sale. So I would encourage people to pull those trees, if, if you're allowed to, out of the pots and look at the roots, make sure they're still alive, make sure they're not root bound, make sure you're getting a quality tree if you're going to invest money in it. And improper wildlife uh, protection, which means things like electric fence, uh, repellents, tree shelters, um, and there's other things. Well, it's Sometimes we do things to try to protect the tree like the, like the image shows where we try to wrap something around the tree to, to help it. Like a lot of people use black tile and that can actually cause more damage from heat. So here's a really good picture I got from Arbor Day Foundation about how to properly plant a tree. Generally, we want a hole that's hand dug if possible, two to three times bigger than the the container that the tree came in if it's containerized and if you have to use an auger make sure that the auger depth is set uh, to the depth of the of the tree you're planting and then hand excavate the, the outer side of it because I, I was working on some plantings this this past fall and and the ground on the side was so hard that we had to use a pickaxe to loosen it so um, that tree wouldn't have wouldn't have done very well if we hadn't done some extra work to the sides of of the planting hole. Um, another thing is sometimes containerized trees are uh, have a layer of mulch on them that's several inches thick, and if you plant to that layer and not to the actual uh, root flare, you can be planting it several inches too deep, which can cause encircling roots and can actually kill the tree. Sometimes if you have encircling roots, um, I tell people get semi-violent with the tree roots. Uh, if they're really entangled, you need to get some kind of a, you know, like a hand trowel or a shovel and break up some of those fine roots and get those in strangling roots if, if you have them and either prune them or stretch them out so they're not going around in circles. Proper watering, the rule of thumb the urban foresters use is one to two gallons of water per caliper inch of tree every several days without rain. Um, mulching can do many, many things to help your, your new trees. Um, we say to mulch like a donut and not a volcano so you don't get decay around your, your tree stems. And with all trees, you kind of have to do some pruning to keep them in the right shape and to keep them structurally sound. Um, and we prefer to do that in the dormant season because there's a lot of forest, uh, well, tree diseases that can be exacerbated if you prune in the growing season. Um, another thing to mention is over pruning, which is common like if, if you're mowing under trees can cause diminished growth because you're reducing basically the solar chargers of the tree, if you want to think about it that way, or the solar panels. And also it exposes more of the trunk to things like sun scald and sun damage. So the more limbs you can keep on the tree, as long as you can, that would be better. And 
more and more often the last few years, I've had a lot of people that are unintentionally hurting their trees with turf herbicides. So keep that in mind, read your labels and avoid stressors like lawnmower blight, um, uh, compaction, things like that. So here's my little discussion about mulch. It does all these things. Acidifies the soil, retains moisture, adds organic matter, insulates roots. Back in 2012 and 13, we lost a ton of young tree plantings because we had cold like we did this year, but we didn't have the snow and it froze several feet deep and it killed a bunch of trees. So mulch would have helped in, the, in those circumstances. Um, mulch is kind of like the forest floor. So we're trying to mimic where the trees would normally want to be growing. And if you have questions about how to deal with grasses around your trees when you do plant, um, generally I recommend using grass specific herbicides and we can talk about that later, but um, they will be far less likely to hurt your trees than a broad spectrum like um, most people use. So there's an example of deer damage, uh, deer rubbing on a pine tree. But you can also have damage from rabbits girdling your trees and mice and other things like that. So here's some methods that I use on all different kinds of um, tree plantings. The upper picture shows a three-dimensional electric fence and it works on the concept of uh, depth perception with deer. And the bottom image shows, if you can see it, um, a five-foot cage that we put around individual hardwood trees in a reforestation site. They both are very, they work very well depending on how much effort you want to put into protection. Another option would be repellents. You have to apply them after strong rains or heavy rainstorms, but um, they're pretty effective. Um, they smell awful and they smell like death on purpose because it makes the prey animals that are usually the ones <laughs> hurting the trees. It smells like death, so they don't want to be anywhere near that. Um, another one we use in hardwood plantings are tree shelters and uh, they're a pretty effective means to get trees beyond the browse line. Corrective pruning is something we would have been doing about a month ago in February, where you take a tree like this cherry that's fully exposed to deer and everything else, and we can prune it back to one liter so it develops uh, good structural limbs and faster growth. I can talk to you more about that too. There's some specifics about how that's accomplished. And big thing is you want to sanitize your pruning tools between um, what you're pruning. I am pretty fanatical about this. When I was pruning last month, I cleaned my tool between every single tree because, um, for, exa for example, cherries and apples, they share things like fire blight, and you don't want to get that started in your, in your tree. It'd be death sentence. Here's some really good um, resources. The first one's a tree owner's manual, which basically has everything you could possibly want to know for how to take care of a tree, it's really amazing. And there's some other sources for native tree stock shown there and um, other nurseries that are local to Southwest Iowa. If you're interested in a windbreak shelter, wind break shelter belt or other tree plantings, um, there's state and federal cost share for that, which I work in the spectrum of tree plantings, not necessarily windbreaks, but they're very similar in their design. Um, State REAP has funding that's administered through the Soil and Water Conservation Districts. Federal EQIP is run through the Natural Resource Conservation Service in every county, and CRP is um, for areas coming out of crop ground. Um, they can also, in certain circumstances, be put into CRP windbreaks. So when you're deciding to uh, Select trees, kind of like we all have been talking about. You want to think about what's already there. You don't want to plant pine where you've had pine wilt or plant more spruce trees where you have active cytospora canker. You don't want to plant spruce trees where you have poor drainage. Um, you want to think about site hazards like salt, compaction, mower blight, resistance to common disease, suitability to microclimate, for example, I have a lot of people interested in using pawpaw. You would not want to plant that in a windbreak because it's fully exposed to sun and wind and 
where they like to live, it is shady and damp. So that would be a totally wrong application for that species. Um, proximity to infrastructure, uh, you don't want to plant windbreaks under power lines, for example, because they may look good for 10 years and then they're going to get topped and then they possibly could get a disease from being pruned. There's other things in rural environments like sewer lines and septic lines that you need to be aware of um, and proximity to roads because you don't want to plant a windbreak and then have it drift on a county road. Here's some trees that are notoriously bad, in my opinion, um, on rural areas. So hybrid maples are really pretty, but they are um, very thin barked. And when they're planted in fully exposed, fully sunny sites, they are, they, they're difficult to keep from getting sun scald. Um, out here in Western Iowa, we have sometimes really alkaline soils. So there's certain species that um, are going to be iron deficient if you plant them there. Some of these are pin oak, swamp white oak, birch. And then, like I've been hammering on, uh, blue spruce and black hill spruce, basically try to avoid those if at all possible. And then scotch and Austrian pine, we, I don't know that anyone plants those anymore unless they're for Christmas trees because of pine whale problems. And if you don't know if you're, if you find a species you like and you don't know if it's native, you know, look it up, or if you still don't know, contact your forester and they would be able to help you out with that. So real quickly, this will be really similar to what Laura had done, but I've got a, a spectrum of native trees for you to look at just so you can see what they look like and get some ideas. So Laura was talking about attracting big game, um, or if you're looking for a really long lasting windbreak, um, these are slower growing trees, but they're gonna be really excellent long-term. This is Baroque, tolerant of almost every area I can think of except for really wet, soggy sites. White oak um, is more of an upland tree, very colorful, um, tolerant of a lot of sites except for where it's damp or wet. Chinkapin oak, uh, really awesome tree, neat leaf. It's gonna be just as colorful as white oak. Um, very, very tolerant of alkaline dry sites. Really good choice for Western Iowa. Then there's red oak. Everything in the red oak family is gonna be sensitive to a disease called oak wilt. So you gotta be careful of that. You don't wanna plant oaks next to each other because they can share that oak wilt disease through root grafts. So planting design is a big deal when you're working with oak trees. But you can notice it's got this nice red color. They're faster growing and um, just all around easy to grow tree. Black oak is very similar. It's gonna be a little bit more orangey brown, fall color, um, still fairly fast growing. There's shingle oak. As you go into South Central Iowa, this tree grows everywhere. It's very, very easy to grow. Keeps its leaves into the fall, which is kind of a neat feature. And I know there's some people starting to use that in windbreaks, which I think is a great idea. Then there's swamp white oak. This is pretty fast growing. Um, it's a white oak, so you've got that advantage of not being super susceptible to oak wilt. Um, not super colorful, but I think its growth rate trumps most of the color set features. There's bitter nut hickory. It's not that commonly thought of for a, a tree to plant because it's so common, but it is easy to grow on some of these semi poorly drained sites. And it's got pretty good fall color. Then there's its cousin shagbark hickory, which a lot of people know because of its neat shaggy bark. And it is the coolest color of goldish orange in, in the fall. You can decide like hard maple. Um, it likes well drained sites. Uh, pretty tolerant of droughty sites, and it makes great habitat and good food sources. Hackberry is an all around awesome tree. It's pretty underutilized because it's so common, but it's, it's pretty bomb proof unless you're being doused by herbicide. It's kind of intolerant to some herbicides, but for all else, it's it's very good tree to use. Then there's, someone mentioned honey locust. That's a really good tree to use. Um, and so is his cousin, Kentucky coffee tree. Uh, both are, I would consider them moderately fast growing. And if you don't like raking up leaves in your yard, those would be really good, 
good species to try. Then there's sycamore. This is one I'm using on my own fast growing windbreak. Uh, they are so super fast. They've got really huge leaves, obviously pretty cool looking bark up top. And um, my hardwood windbreak is about, I'm trying to think, it's gonna be six years old this summer. And my sycamores are already more than 20 feet tall. And it's been, um, like I said, six years and they started as bare roots. Then there's cottonwood, which is also which is also super fast and about 10 feet taller than my sycamores. Um, highly recommend this, even if you end up cutting them out of your windbreak, but they're really good trainer trees to help force your other trees up and shade the site out. And just throw this out there, a lot of people have used hybrid poplar to get the same effect because they're fast growing. I would prefer if people used cottonwood because they're longer lasting and they won't break off from um, canker fungi in the future. <laughs> then there's silver maple, same thing, super fast growing. These um, certain varieties of these have really bushy habitat or, or bushy forms. So like you see in this picture, that would be a really good windbreak tree because there's so many limbs coming out um, of the root. This would not be a great type of tree to put right next to your house because all those big limbs could eventually split and fall on your house. So that'd be something you'd plant away um, as an ex exterior row, let them do the work and plant something more attractive close to your house. There's black cherry, we talked a lot about it today. I also have planted this, it's super easy to grow. You can make jelly out of it, it's colorful uh, and the birds really love it. Red mulberry, not a lot of people know or think about this one. Um, it's native to low areas in Western Iowa and, and Southern Iowa. If you want more information on any of this stuff, just give us a shout. Then there's service berry. We already talked about that one. It's the first to flower in the, in the spring and it turns kind of orangey in the fall. So it's a really good medium tree to consider. Same as its cousin down east hawthorn which is kind of like our native crab apple tree. Then there's ironwood, which if you really wanted a birch tree and you had really alkaline soils, I would have people consider ironwood as an alternative. Wild plum, uh, just all around amazing tree for most conservation applications um, and makes some of the best jelly known to man. Here's a weirdo that doesn't really have much food value, but is really pretty. So a lot of people like burning bush, but they don't know that actual burning bush is invasive, um, non-native. So it's native cousins called Eastern Wahoo, and it turns kind of pinkish red, like you see in the picture. And then in the winter time, those little pink and red capsules stay on the, the, the limbs and it looks really, really cool. Then there's bladder nuts. So if you're looking for an alternative to honeysuckle and you're wanting something that grows kind of in a thicket in shade, bladder nut is the native um, shrub that does that job. Witch hazel would be another um, shrub you could plant in those shady areas, kind of out like on the north side of your house or something. We've already talked about hazelnut and its many, many uses. Button bush, if you've got a poorly drained wet site, oh man, these are so cool. They, they flower in June. They're really, really easy to grow, even on, on dry sites. And uh, yeah, that's, that's what they look like. I've got one in my rain garden. False indigo, also another poorly drained uh, shrub. And you can also plant it on well-drained sites. It's like lead plant on steroids. It's got those neat uh, purple plumes kind of in late May, early June. Highly recommend it. And I do think there is a strong need for red cedar on the landscape as long as you use it responsibly and you're not planting it next to a prairie that you're never gonna burn. If you're managing your prairie, I see no reason why you can't use red cedar. And if you're worried about it, um, there are male and female red cedar trees. So if there's a way to do it, make sure you've got male, male red cedars planted and they won't have a, a problem with it seeding. White pine's a good choice as long as you don't have deer pressure. If you do, you're gonna have to use some deer protection. Jack pine would be a good alternative to Eastern red cedar if you don't like the look of red cedar. 
there's con color for kind of finicky tree, but if you do use it, use it as an interior tree um, where it's not going to be up against the wind and the sun. Norway spruce, if someone like made me pick a spruce at this point in time that has not many problems, it would be Norway spruce. They get really massive, so you want to be sure that uh, you give them at least 30 feet of spacing between rows and within rows. And they're pretty tolerant of clay, which is why a lot of people plant them. So with that, um, we'll see if you guys have any questions. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. And we do have some questions here. Um, one of them was the best shrubs uh, to place near your house, maybe for shade. Oh, for shade? Like, um, how how tall are they wanting the, the shrub to be? Hmm. It doesn't say. <laughs> Ah, shade and air conditioning. Oh. I'm getting my question feed up here. Okay, so, yeah, I think, yeah, so there's shade for the AC, as or no AC, yeah, shade AC, okay. <clears throat> there we go, south side of the house to shade that air conditioner. Yeah, let's just go with trees. Um, it, it depends on how fast you want it to grow. Um, in my circumstance, I knew I was about to lose a pin oak because they're not suited to where I live. And so I replaced it with a uh, sycamore because they're a good structural tree and they're also exceptionally fast growing. So that's what I did. Um, if you're not comfortable having a sycamore near your house because a lot of people think they're dirty, then you could use something like, um, you know, a thornless honey locust or one of the faster growing oaks like swamp white or red or black. Um, black cherry I've also used in my yard. It is exceptionally fast. You might have to correctively prune it for a few years to get it to the right shape, but it's a really good tree. Lindsay, this yep. is Brad. Um, smaller trees, if they don't have the space for it, things like red buds or service berry anything like that you recommend so the line for red bud is what like i-80 or is it 30. well, well now red. in northern iowa we do have those minnesota red buds that we can grow but <laughs> so, yeah i, I mean I'm not sure of the line yeah that i'd say if you've got a good variety that's northern capable go for it I, I i have a row of red buds myself because they're awesome and Ironwood, if you can get your hands on it, not muscle wood. You could use muscle wood, but true Australia Virginiana, the true ironwood, top horn beam. Uh, let's see. I mentioned downy hawthorn, which is a native hawthorn, be an excellent tree and also good to keep people out of your yard because it's kind of pokey, it's just like uh, <laughs> wild plum. It's pokey. Uh, what about replacing those white pines? So they, so they want to replace pine with. Uh, we had a windbreak that derecho came through, tore out some of the white pine pretty badly. So what might be some um, suggested replacement species? So old pine sites are really excellent uh, nurseries for hardwoods, if they're willing to consider it. I've seen a lot of dying pine plantings that instantly start sprouting up with hardwoods because those pine needles have sat there and acidified the soil and made it just like perfect growing medium for trees. But if they've only got a couple rows there to work with, like the equivalent of a couple rows, then, you know, if you could talk them into red cedar, that would be a, a good start. Or at least have one row of cedar on the outer windward row you can plant them really tight, you know, like 10 feet, they don't care. And then put something more attractive closer to your house if you're going with evergreens. Like, um, you know, we mentioned Norway spruce, conch or fir, you can alternate those. Um, 
You can put back Excellent. white pine if the dratio just caused the damage. There's no reason you couldn't put white pine back in there. Another question about using Serbian spruce or Fraser fir, as they tend to do well in eastern Iowa. I don't have any experience with either of those, but um, from what I've heard from some of the eastern Iowa foresters, that th they will do well on the appropriate sites, and and I think um, they are listed on our woodland suitability list. Question about the uh, gator bags. I think it might be a name brand for them, but the bags that you wrap around the trees for watering. Any thoughts from anyone on those? I think that's a better option than um, running a hose out for half an hour. It's, it's metered like five gallons or whatever. I think it's a good idea. And this is Brad, and I would just monitor to see if there's any like moisture buildup in there. Uh, if they stay on a long time. That would be my only concern because um, you really don't want to have a lot of moisture around that new bark. How do those work? Are they are they like a cone or does it go all the way around the tree? A lot of them go all the way around the tree. Oh. So I mean, it's, I, that would be my concern, you know, if it's uh, if that's the case. But um, if you can get airflow in there. Um, between waterings or something, I think you'd be okay. Okay, great. Um, and what other questions do we have here? Uh, spray drift, what would be a, a good species to help resist spray drift from fields? Here's your answer, Lindsay. <laughs> I, my tongue-in-cheek answer is um, I tell people if you got the harshest environment, plant stuff that you see growing in the ditch. So that would be red cedar, smooth sumac, which I didn't mention. I should have mentioned that because it's an amazing shrub as long as you're not planting it in a prairie. Um, rough leaf dogwood, gray dogwood, those would all be things I would consider. Things that are na native things that are hard to kill. That's what I would plant in my windbreak. Okay. You've seen those about the, I was going to ask about downy hawthorn too. Do you get any fire blight or any uh, disease issues with that, Lindsay? Yeah, all the native ones I see. Yeah, and I know where Maggie's talking about all the ones down that way every year. They're just, it's like the crab apples. They get terrible uh, leaf diseases. Okay. Question about pawpaw trees and where you might put pawpaw trees in a windbreak. That would be something you could use for succession planting. Um, so you'd have to have your, you know, your first round of planting done. Let's say you had some hardwoods going and they were starting to cast some shade. Then I might bring in the pawpaw as a mid-story tree and plant them underneath the other trees. Cause that's, that's where they grow in nature in the shade. Excellent. How much diversity should we be shooting for in a windbreak? So how many different species of conifers, for example, or in a hardwood setting like you referenced, where we're looking at maybe six to eight rows, would each row be different? I beg and plead people with people to, and this like, if you're kind of, particular about the way you see things visually, this this will kill you. But <laughs> I try to get people to mix up their plantings as much as possible. So I want different species next to, like different species mixed in each row and between rows. I know it looks really, really cool. And I'm, you know, I like the way linear uh, windbreaks look. Uh, it's very aesthetically pleasing, but it's a conduit for disease. So if you can mix, you know, I'd say at least three to four species. That's what we use for tree planting specs is at least four different species that are not in the same genus and mix them all up all throughout your planting. It'll look more natural. Um, and, and it can, in some circumstances, help your trees grow faster depending on what you pick. 
because some act as trainer trees and some are your slower growing trees and the faster growing ones will help the slower growing ones grow taller faster. Would that be the same for the evergreens? I mean, we we'll would be looking at mixing maybe a Norway spruce with um, um, a Fraser fir or something like that? That is an interesting thought. I've been trying to think of windbreak trees, evergreens that you could use uh, to fill in gaps. I've gotten that question a lot and I've thought about hemlock, eastern hemlock for that purpose because it can grow in the shade. So can red cedar. Um, I think it's possible as long as you don't uh, put like species next to each other because if they can share that disease by rain splash, they're going to do it. Excellent. What else do we have here? Arborvitae as a row in windbreak. Thoughts? If it was an interior close to the house row and it was had a fortress around it, I think that would be good. <laughs> so, so Lindsay, a lot of times I see people, you know, I mean, you have a really narrow space, so that's, they want to, if they're going to only use one row, that's what they're going to use. Is that, what are the, the drawbacks to that? Well, I'm sure you've seen it too, Brad. You go to like Council Bluffs and there's like a mow line where the deer have pruned the lower six feet off of those arbor vitae, and then you've lost all the wind breaking power where you really need it at like six feet. Mm -hmm. So that's a problem. That's why I say you need a fence. And then we've had some mysterious forest health issues with white cedar. So you, you just kind of uh, be a little bit cautious with that one, I guess, and make sure you've got the appropriate site. Mm -hmm. Let's see, more advice for rebuilding or replacing our windbreak after derecho damage in Eastern Iowa. Um, might be a plug for contacting your forester. What do you think? <laughs> totally. I know they've been really busy putting everything back together on uh, private timbers, but yeah, I think that's totally within the realm of what they can help you with. Do you know, um, I guess it varies by office, do, does, um, do the uh, NRCS or the, the USDA offices have some of that ability or not, Lindsay, do you know? So the way it works, at least down here, is that the people that write the specs and administer the financial assistance are going to be the Soil and Water District or NRCS. And the district foresters, uh, don't do a lot of windbreak writing plans, but we do get a lot of calls on um, like what we're talking about here, like what species would do best on this site. And that's that's the kind of thing we can answer. Okay. Thank you. Will trimming lower branches harm the windbreak benefits? And maybe we could get some guidance on how low that might be. And in the meantime, would you be willing to bring up your resources slide, um, uh, Lindsay? Just back yeah. up a couple. And, and while you're doing that, Lindsay, I'm gonna take a first stab at that one. Yes, trimming lower branches will impact your your windbreak benefits especially if you have nothing else planted there so um you're removing you're removing the the material that you're you're hoping to keep the wind from moving into your site so uh by doing that is it opens it up i know i know then you can get under it and mow it some people do that and so it's like okay but do you want the windbreak to impact or not so my my goal would always be is always to leave as leave the branches all the way down to the ground and work around uh, what's there uh, to get the full impact of that that tree. I think the nurseries was the one, the resource one uh, that was referenced. I had another slide in there about uh, it. I didn't know which one they were looking for. Uh, no, not the cost share one then. 
I think it might have been the nurseries and whoever typed that maybe you can give us some additional. Okay, yep. Sure. Yes, nursery, there you go. Oh, it looks like a question from Maggie on the East Coast. People will create a 12 to 16 foot privacy fence with shrubs, uh, such as privet. Uh, any thoughts on a practice like this? I have been uh, interested in using this in, in places like um, campgrounds where people kind of like some privacy between campsites. So I'm all for it. Um, just want to be sure whatever you're uh, using is doesn't have the potential to become invasive. That'd be my plug. Yeah, Lindsay, here in Cass County, we've done that um, up in our campground with, uh, I believe it's all that cranberry. I'd have to look it up again. Um, with that back row of screen. Uh, looking at the names here. Is it high bush cranberry, Laura? Yes, I think it is high bush cranberry. That's what I'm thinking. So we are trying it at least a little bit. All right. Okay, we have a, a comment here. Fraser Nursery in Vinton designs and builds windbreaks of all sizes. So uh, thanks for the plug there. Excellent if you're out in eastern Iowa. We have a question on how close to a six foot privacy fence can we actually plant a windbreak without stunting tree growth by the shading. The privacy fence is on the west of the windbreak. Oh, interesting. So if you're planting big evergreens like mm -hmm. Norway, let's say, their span is like 50 feet probably when they're full size. So you have to divide that in half, you know? So <laughs> it'd be like 25 feet from your fence. But if you're doing something like a shrub, maybe 10 feet would be appropriate. So you've got a little passageway between your fence for maintenance and where your shrubs will be. It just kind of all depends on what you're going to plant. Mm -hmm. In general, most species are going to be, I always think about it, 30 feet. I mean, you know, unless you get something really columnar like the arborvitaes that can be packed in there you know, eventually just about any of our conifers are really going to spread out and be, be that big life size. Well, what else do we have here? Any last questions, folks? Oh, well, Maggie shares in the Hamptons, there are amazing privacy privet hedges. My Century Farm had a wonderful privet hedge on the north boundary until the county roads made us remove it. Oh, shucks. I, I can imagine. That is a good uh, point to bring up is that uh, I had to be aware of this on my own windbreak is you do not want to plant things close to your right of way. If the county needs to maintain the right of way and they spray the root system of a tree or a shrub, um, that's that's kind of not the county's <laughs> problem if, you, if what you planted is out in the right of way where they need to maintain. So just give yourself a buffer there. And this would be a great opportunity to plug Field Watch, which is a, a great resource where if you have any sort of uh, specialty crop or bees or any sensitive type of planting, get it marked on Field Watch so that everybody knows what you have, where you have it. It's not a cure-all. It doesn't mean that the things might not happen. And certainly our counties need to maintain their roadways. But um, if you get on Field Watch, that'll go a long way of letting everybody know what you have planted. Good point, Jeff. Thank you. Well, Brad, any last thoughts? I think this was great. I appreciate everybody's questions, um, your willingness to stick around and, and ask and, and share, and much appreciated. I want to really thank uh, Lindsay and Laura for joining us and, and adding a lot of uh, information to the basic stuff that I put out there. So I really appreciate that. Um, and want to encourage everybody to plant trees this spring. 
Hey, real quick, one last thing. Uh, the National Agroforestry Center out of Lincoln, Nebraska, and everybody can Google them. Uh, I want to just plug them as a fantastic resource for all things agroforestry. And one of the exciting things they have is a complete field windbreak and living snow fence series. Uh, I think it's almost eight or nine different specific pamphlets from how to go about planning, planting, establishing, rejuvenating for wildlife, for snow capture, just a wealth of information alone in that uh, windbreak and, and, and snow fence uh, series. So check it out, some great uh, graphics. It'll really help to explain what's happening uh, when we develop a snow fence. So with that, everyone, have a great night. Thanks for joining us and uh, plant more trees.